This is what you had from last time. We talked about arrays. We understood what arrays are. Essentially, arrays are when we uh, um, are used when we um, have series of uh, uh, variables needed of the same type. So we create arrays, and uh, in one shot, we can create thousands of variables, and we can access the variables using the index of the array that starts from 0 up to the size of the array minus 1. Everybody's okay with this, right? Problem? We're okay? Beautiful. Nice. Nobody has problem with it. Okay, so um, I want to talk about a special type of array. Um, this type of array, let's, let me just save this as, uh, I'm going to put 0, 1, parallel arrays. That's what we ended up our... A few things I want to fill, it, fill in the blanks, things that I need to continue with this. I'm going to first do those, and then we're going to uh, uh, continue with the uh, rest of the topics. All right. When we were talking about type of variables that we had, we came to the reality that C language is incapable of holding statements. It's only about digits when it comes to C language. The only thing that, is that, that C language is capable of holding are numbers and nothing but that. You cannot hold someone's name. You cannot hold a, a, a message. You cannot hold a sentence. That doesn't work. Okay. Um, and we know how C deals with a single character. Um, how does it deal with a single character? How does C work with a single character? How does it keep it? ASCII code in a in a in an integer whose name is the type of the character, right? And how big a character can be? Do you remember? No, no. How big of a like the how big an ASCII code can be? What is the biggest ASCII code? 255. Close enough. That's good enough. Okay. So, two, so it goes up to 255, right? So, so that's what it is. That's what a character is. And they said, okay, um, now we know what arrays are, right? So if I want to hold my name inside a variable, I can play a trick. I can create an array of characters and start putting the letters one by one, F-A-R-D-A-D. -D. So six characters in an array keep it, and I can hold my name in it, right? There's one problem with this thing. What's your name? Um, Jason. Jason, okay. J, Jason, that's five characters, right? Uh, we have Lee, L-I, okay? That's two characters. If I want to hold my last name, I don't even know, Soleiman, 11 characters. The problem is that with this, and um, I had a, a student, her name was I don't know, like 52 characters? So these things happen, right? So there, we have a problem. When you have an integer, you say integer A, and you put 32 in it. You can overwrite that 32 with 3 million. Then you can overwrite that 3, 3 million with minus 2. They all have the same size. No matter how big or small you make a number, okay, depending of what it has a maximum capacity of course you cannot go more than that but if you have 50 or 55 the size doesn't change it's the same type of variable if you have a double if it's 3 billion or 1.32 it holds the exact same amount of space so we don't have any problem the problem that we have with names is that it varies in size and because it varies in size i have to kind of find a way to find out where does it end. Okay, if I want to hold someone's name, what is the longest name you've ever heard? What, like let's say 20 characters? So I can create an array, an array of 20 characters and assume that most of the names, 99% of the names on planet Earth is gonna fit in that 20 characters, right? So I'm gonna create an array if I wanna hold someone's name, I can actually create an array something like this. So 
I can say character name 20, right? I can say character name 20. There is a problem with that. How do I know what is the length of the name in that one? Is it Fardad with six characters? Or it's Lee with three characters? Or Lee with two characters? How do I know? It's an absolute impossibility. C language is not capable of knowing what is the length. It doesn't even know what is the length of an array. C doesn't know that that name is 20 characters. You have to remember it. <laughs> if you go start putting values over that go to 25, C won't let to prevent you of doing that. The program's going to crash because you exceed the size of the array. C is incapable of knowing the size of an array. Now I'm I want to ask C, what is the size of the data in an array? Do I, am I using two characters? Am I using six? Am I using 15? I don't know. OK? So they say, we can play a trick in this thing. What can we do? We can tag the end of data. We can start putting the data, and when it ends, we can put a character over there that is not ASCII. It's code of nothing. You follow me? What is the code of nothing? What is, what is the only number in ASCII code that doesn't relate to any character? It's zero. So they said, we're going to start putting the values in it and end it with a zero. And like that, when I'm printing it, I can write a loop, start printing the characters, and check the value of the character before printing, of course. Start checking one, two, three, four, five. As soon as I see, oh, the content of this character is zero, it means it's in the data. I'm not going to print anything anymore. So essentially, I, gotta, I have to do something like this. I got to say it's set to, oh gosh, this is difficult. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I'm going to say F, A, R, D, A, D. And at the end, I'm going to put the integer zero, not the character. This is not zero. <laughs> this has a code. I don't know what it is. 40, I don't know what it is. What is the value? Not that zero. I'm going to put the integer zero over there. Okay? Now, if I want to print this name, all I need to do is to say for i set to zero. And in here, I'm going to say and name i not equal to zero and i plus plus. And then I start printing it. Printf percent %c, and in here I'm going to say name i. And when everything is over, I'm going to say printf backslash n and go to new line. So now if I run this code, what's going to happen? Uh, is 4 OK or want me to change it to while? Everybody's OK with the for loop? Anybody over here want me to change it to a while loop to be more understandable? They're okay? And don't be shy when I ask these questions. If you want to change something, say, yes, I want to. Because if you're thinking about it, believe me, 10 other people are thinking about it, and they're shy, and they're not, talk, they're not saying it. So please ask for it. Anyways, so if I want to do that, actually, the heck with it. I'll do it. Wow. So this is, I'm going to initialize. <clears throat> i to 0 over here, <clears throat> and I'm going to bring this plus plus right at the end. It's for the sake of walking through it. That's, that's all. OK, so now if I run this beautiful program of mine, three years later, four years later, five years later, it actually compiles. I'm going to put it over here in this one. So it's going to start going. So as you see, it comes in, name 0 is f, and f is 70, right? So it's not, because 70 is not equal to 0, so it's going to keep printing it. So it prints f, a, r, d, a, and it prints d, adds 1 to that one, comes up. Now, 
name i is the value 0. And value 0 does not correspond to anything. Because of that, it puts backslash 0. OK, so remember, potatoes, potatoes. These two are the same, OK? All right? So now it's 0, and that goes false. It comes out, prints a new line, and far that is printed. Are we OK with this? Are we OK? Are we OK? Are we OK 1? Are we OK 2? Sold. OK. So I have a question. My question is, which one of these stuff? There you go. <laughs> My question is, did I need to put this 0 over here? Did I need to put that 0 over there? I want to follow the regulation. I want to make sure that the data is, is marked with a 0 that the data is ended. If I didn't put that 0, it wouldn't work. It's because, it's because you don't remember arrays that we've been talking about initialization. I said if you initialize the elements of an array and then the, the, the number of initialization is less, less than the number of elements in the array, what happens to the rest? This, the rest becomes zero. So that zero that I put over there is something redundant. It's going to be set anyway. OK? Are we OK with this? Are we OK? All right. So if, even if I didn't put that zero over there, it would have worked the exact same way. OK? Now, because that's a pain, like if I want to put Varda over there, it takes 9 million years, right? So 0 to string, see? Because that's a pain, they said, OK, instead of doing that, just write this. They're the same, no difference. Are we OK with this? So this and curly brackets and initial, it's exactly the same, no difference. All right? So I, and I don't need to put a zero at the end because when it sets whatever it is, is in here, the rest will be zero, right? But this is, so now I want you to listen and I want you to listen carefully to what I'm saying. This standard, this rule, this rule that is followed by all C programmers is called a string. If somebody asks you what's a string in C language, the answer is it's a character array that the data within is terminated with a null. Null means zero. Okay? So, essentially, uh, so, but the textbook answer for it when you're going tomorrow for an interview to get hired for C programming, they're going to tell you what is a string. You're going to say null terminated array of, uh, array of characters. Okay? So string, array of characters, are identical things. The only difference is that in a string, you are following your rule, which means you are saying, I am to stop when I get to a to null. As a matter of fact, this standard is so old that goes to the beginning of C language. So they actually hard-coded this within certain functions. So instead of having this loop written, this loop is actually hard, is hard coded in many functions. For example, in printf, I can say percent %s, and I put over here name. So what happens, it gets, gets get the array of name, OK? Start printing in the elements one by one, or Start printing in elements until you get to zero. So if you would percent %s, what you put over there is name of an array. Are we OK with this? Array of characters. That is essentially a string. OK? Now, if I don't put, like, just to show you 
So if I put over here Soleiman Lu, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, Wow, it's actually less than 20 characters. Okay, so if I do this and I print it, I'm going to get far that Soliman loop. Of course, I can put a backslash n, so it goes to new line. Are we okay? Now let me show you this. So this is index 0. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So in here, after printing, I'm going to say name 10 is set to 0. And I'm going to print the name again. What is the output of line 7? It's going to truncate it. It's going to print Fardat Sol. Okay, because it overwrites the E if I count it properly, if I count it correctly. It's going to overwrite E with a null, and because now the stop sign is halfway through the array, it's going to ignore the rest. Did I erase the rest? No. Are they still in memory? Yes, they are. But because I blocked it with a null, it follows the standard and it stops. So if I run this code, You'll see that the, if I run this code, you're going to see the second one is going to be far that sol. Are we okay with this? Yes. Uh, what, when we find name 10 is 0, didn't we like, restructure the whole array to be 10 digits, 10 characters? No, you're just saying element 10 is 0. You, only, you can never restructure an array. Right. C is incapable of doing that. When you ask for it, you got it. It's 20 characters. This is why, okay? This is why. Now, again, listen to me carefully. And you're gonna be, I'm going to be asking you this in a quiz. This time it's real. I'm not joking, okay? I'm going to be asking you this. To hold a name that is 15 characters, what kind of array I need? Array of characters. How many elements do I need? 16. 16. You've got to put a 0 at the end. Remember that, right? So remember, because of this fact, any time you are dealing with strings, you have to always add one more character for that 0. If it's supposed to be 3, you have to have 4. Okay? It has nothing to do with the index being started then from zero and going one to the left. It has nothing to do with that. I'm talking about the length of the array. I'm not talking about the index. Are we okay with this? Are we okay? Are we okay one? Are we okay two? Sold. All right. That's that. Let me see if I can see properly with this one. Ah, kind of. Let's see. So, all right. Zero two string in printf. All right, I'm going to pause recording. What I'm going to mention right now, remember, strings are arrays, and you cannot assign them. You can only initialize them. So if you have, in, oh, sorry, if you have character str10, you have one chance to initialize it to a value, John. That's it. Later on, if you want to set it to something else, you have to copy things character by character and terminate the end of data with an all. You can't just do it this way. Okay, just remember that. Don't worry, there are functions written for it. As we see standard input output header file over there, we actually have a header file called string header file. There are functions written to do those things for us that you're going to learn at the end of the semester. But for now, I just want you to understand what strings are and use it with printf. That's all. Okay? 
Are we okay? So you have one chance to initialize it. Later in a program, if you say SDR is equal to Jack, this is wrong. You can't do this. Okay? Because SDR is not one element. It has 10 elements. And you are interested to set the first four to these values. You have to write a loop for it. All right? Are we okay with this? All right. Wrong. Can't do since SDR is an array. And arrays can only be set with a loop. All right? Save. Zero, three. Init string only. Dot C. All right. Out of strings. Now we know what strings are. Next thing we need to know. Condition or expression. The question mark operator. The question mark operator is a very weird operator that we need to know it. I'm just filling the blanks, and after this, I'm going to go start teaching the things that I wanted to teach. Okay? Conditional operator, or the question mark operator, is a fast way of doing if an assignment. If an assignment. Okay? If and assignment. All right? For example, Say I want to get two numbers from the user and, and, and set a variable to the biggest one. Okay? So the program that I'm going to write will be print. Please enter two integers, let's say, two ints. Then in here I'm going to go scanf, percent %d, percent %d, and I'm going to put over here address of num1 and address of num2. Int num1. Int num2. And I'm going to say, say int max, I'm going to call it, OK? So in here, I'm going to say if num1 is greater than num2, do something else, do something else. So if that's the case, I'm going to say max is set to num1. Otherwise, max is set to num2. I have no idea what type of num1 is that. There you go. Now I'm going to say printf percent %d is the larger value. New line, max. Are we okay with this piece of code? Anybody have any question about this piece of code? Are we okay? Now, they have written, because such thing is needed a lot, and this, is a, and this type of decision making is, they need, they need this a lot. And because of that fact, they want to make it quicker. Because of that, because of this reason, they have created an operator that does this, which means when you have a variable that you want to set to a certain value based on a condition, you can write this code for it. So instead of writing lines from 9 to 14, you can only write one line. Max is set to num1 greater than num2, question mark num1 column num2. Line 16 does exactly what line 9 to 14 does. Do. Okay? So if this condition is correct, the first thing is going to get, the first operand over here is going to get evaluated and going to max. If it's false, the second one is going to go to max. There is one important catch with this. Because of certain needs to make it fast, these two must be the exact same type. 
You cannot have two different types here and here. They must be identical. Two ints, two floats, two doubles. You cannot have an integer and a double. If you are, you have to cast one to a double. OK? Remember that. Are we OK with this? Yes. What happens if num1 and num2 are the same number? You tell me. Is the transition true or false? So num2 goes to max. Remember, whenever you don't know what the answer is, turn your intelligence to off. Be dumb as a doorknob, and then walk through. You'll find the answer. Because that's what a computer is. And what I just told you sounds funny, but that's how you walk through. If for a second you use your intelligence, you're going to shoot yourself in the foot. OK? Always, when you are following a code to see what happens, turn your intelligence to off, literally. Dumb as a doorknob, duh, and then look at the code. Just follow the instruction and see what happens. OK? That's why I say walk through. Condition is false, num2 goes over there. See? But if you think about it, hmm, well, you're going to notice what's No, there's, there's no intelligence behind the thing. OK? Remember that. Are we OK with this? Yes. If condition num1 and num2 is true, num1 will be evaluated and passed back. If num1 greater than num2 is false, num2 will be evaluated and passed back. All right? But like any other thing, any other expression in C, you can ignore this. If you're not interested to pass back the value and you just want something to happen, as long as the return type of both are the same, you can do this. So this works like a quick if statement. As long as these two types are the same. OK? So you'll see something like this many times, that they don't use the return value because they just want it to be quick. All right? So max is set to, and this is going to be, I'm going to comment that. So if I run this, essentially, it's going to work like this. All right? Any question? Suggestion? Objection? Are we good? So, wrong window. Uh, now let's bring back uh, the parallel array thingy that we had. <clears throat> Remember about all these S's and stuff like that I wanted to do and we don't know how to do it? We had to write 50 lines of code to do that. We can fix that now. So we don't have this, the total number of students pass the assignment while the idea of, of them fell. So if I want this S to be there or not to be there, I can just do this. I can put over here percent C, percent S for a string, because string has different length, right? And then, so this is the second thing that I have. Let me just break this into two. So I can see what I'm doing and bring this down. There you go. So past plus just past will go into percent %d, right? Now, if this thing is greater than 1, this has to be s. If it's not, it should be nothing, correct? So I can actually right here, I can put that thing, that operator, I can say, If this is greater than 1, question mark, pass S. If not, pass an empty string. OK? So if this condition is greater than 1, this will be evaluated. A string will be sent to percent %s. That has one character. 
it prints this one, then it sees the next one is null, it stops, right? If this is greater, if this is not greater than one, which means it's equal, right? Then the second one's gonna be passed. The second one is an empty string. What is an empty string? A character array whose first element is null, right? The beginning of data is null, there's nothing in there. So it gets passed over there. As soon as it wants to print it, it's at the end, right? So nothing gets printed. Ta-da. So all that if statement thingy will go. And you can do the exact same thing to the second one. Do it yourself. OK? And all the things that we had. So as an exercise, do that. Are we OK with this? I'm not going to run it. I don't want to waste time on that. Any questions down to here? Yes. What are we talking about? You're talking about this one? That's a format specifier. Format specifiers in printf work like this. I'll go printf percent %c percent %d percent %s and say percent %lf and because I have set them in that order, the first one should be a character, the second one should be an integer, the third one should be a string, and the fourth one should be a double number. Correct? So essentially, the first one, let me just comment this, the first one goes to first format specifier, the second one goes to second format specifier, the third one goes to third, and the fourth one goes to fourth, correct? That's how printf works. Now let's come down here. The first one is an integer. I have an integer, right? The second one's in a string, right? Conditional expression evaluates the condition, it checks the condition, and evaluates these two values. Those two values are both string, right? Ta-da, string. One of them is going to get passed to this one. Which one? We don't care. All right? And at the end, I have a string, uh, sorry, an integer, and I have an integer. It's a match. Life is beautiful. Are we okay? Are we okay? You are getting slowly into C programming. Down to this point, it was just any language. Now, these are the things that you, you can't do in most programming languages unless they are children of C, like Java, C Sharp, and things like that, right? Are we OK? Are we OK? One, two, all right, next one. So zero, 04, conditional operator in printf dot c. You can see it down there, so you know what I'm talking about, right? Um, OK. Now the lecture begins. Any questions? Suggestions? I need a break. I don't know about you. <clears throat> Paul. Now we are going to talk about functions. Functions in C language are functions in C language are separate blocks of code that can be called several times. Okay? They are separate blocks of code. For example, this main that you see, it's one function. But because the main, main is being called by op operating system, that doesn't make sense to call it over and over. But if you write a function with any other name, you can call it in main 50 times, and it's going to get repeated 50 times. And every time a function is called, everything starts in it fresh from zero. And when it ends, everything that was created in it will die. So essentially, each function is a small program of its own. OK? So a function, is that a question? Yeah. Go ahead. So, so is, is that a function? 
that's a function. It's literally a function. But because C language is a language of functions, there must be a beginning. Otherwise, how does the operating system know where to begin everything? So it has to be the influence of exactly. So it's actually the main. The real f uh, signature of main is not like this. Main actually, this, the real main looks something like something else. We'll talk. You'll see in probably three, four, five. But the name is what is important. The name main can only be one. You cannot have two of them. And operating system starts that, and you are responsible to call all the other functions that you need from main to make your program work. What is good about this thing? To be able to break your program down into small pieces? Obviously. To make, to make things possible. Like if I ask you to do anything, you cannot do it all at once. You have to break it down into pieces. Do the pieces and put them together. Everything works that way. Every single thing works that way. You create pieces, you put the pieces together, and you have one thing to go through. Right? Like if you look at a car, a car by itself is a car, right? But it has an engine. Engine by itself is an engine. It's a separate entity, separate working entity that has a responsibility, a reason to be. And that a car without it means nothing. Okay? You have tires in car. You have four of them. The responsibility is to carry the vehicle around. And without it, it has its own functionality. You have brakes. You have little pieces. Any being out there, anything that you want to simulate into a program, it has pieces. And to do everything in one main thing is impossible. You have to do it in small pieces. Functions, now another rule that we have in functions, and there is no question behind it. You can't ask me why. If the reason is the sky is high. I mean, like, that's how it is. In C language, okay, a function is capable of receiving copies of many things to start at work. That guy has telepathic powers or something. <laughs> Have you seen the guy comes in, like X-Man come in and poof, other light goes out? That's it. All right. So people on YouTube, people are going to get confused. What the heck is going on in there? Anyway, so what do I saying? Yeah. So a function can receive copies of many things. And that's all it does. To a function, you always receive copies of things. You can pass 50 things into a function if you want to. Function gets those values the way you design it, does whatever it's supposed to do, takes action. The engine works in there. It does its purpose, it does what it's supposed to do. And you could return only one value back. It's impossible to be two. C language is incapable of sending two things back. So functions receive copies of as many things as you want and returns copy of only one thing from its gut. So whatever you have in a function, whatever you build in a function, whatever you create in a function, you can send a copy out of it, copy of that out to the to to the calling function, to whoever actually use that. But that's the only thing. You cannot return two things. Yes. And don't talk about pointers. I'm going to kill you. OK. Can yeah. a function uh, manipulate existing variables in the program? No. No. With our knowledge, no. What I told you, what I told you at this stage is what I told you is absolute truth, OK? When the time comes and I'm going to show you tricks of how to manipulate stuff outside of a function. When you write a function that I told you, it's a separate entity. It's a different entity right beside main. It's a program of its own. It has a beginning of its life, and it has an end of its life. 
And when it comes into the scope, it does whatever it's supposed to or it goes out. It cannot change anything in main. But we can play tricks so it can. Okay? Those tricks will come to it. By nature, by design, functions are incapable to do anything outside of their own scope. They are a closed entity. They get copies of several things. They do whatever is needed. And then they can return only one thing out. If I put it in correct terms, a function can return, receive nothing or many things and return nothing or one thing. Okay? A, a function that receives nothing and returns nothing. The point of entry in a function is within the parentheses over here. Okay? So if I want to write a function, I think we did that last time, for the welcome thingy, I can actually say void. I don't want this to return anything. Welcome, or let's call it title. Title, void. So this function doesn't receive anything, doesn't return anything. The only thing it does is to print the title. That's all. For the function, now if I want to actually call that function, I have to put its name and parentheses in front of it. Because I'm not passing anything to it, inside parentheses there's nothing. Because it doesn't receive anything, it's nothing. All those people who did your labs without a void in your main, I skipped it now, okay? You do it again, you lose mark, okay? Remember that. That's C++. You cannot leave the void empty over here. You have to put something in there. You have to put void. It means I'm not receiving anything, all right? Are we okay with this? Pause. So, how to write the functions properly? We mentioned that we don't want the functions to be at the top. We want to put the functions at the bottom. If we put it at the bottom, because compiler comes from the top, when it reaches the function call, it hasn't seen the function. It gives you an error that the function is not there. Okay? I told you many times there are tutors down in the learning center. How many people actually went to the tutors? One. There you go. The rest of you trust me, right? Right? That it's there. So I actually told you there is a function called tutor down in Learning Center. You don't actually know if it's there or not. That gentleman knows because he actually went through them. Okay? So you can do the exact same thing to the functions. When you write a function, you can actually tell to the compiler, hey, these functions, you see these functions? exist down there, trust me. How do you do that? You only put their name up there with no body. Okay? So you are telling to, to the compiler, trust me, it's there, compile. Compiler is going to translate and do everything and when it's done, when it works, you actually link it and make it an executable, then it checks to, in all the files. Is there an HR function? Yes, there is. Good. If it's not, then you're gonna give, it's going to give you an error at link time. So it compiles just fine, and it links it. And it doesn't matter if these functions are actually in the same file. You can even put it in a separate file. It doesn't matter. As long as you tell to the, to the using function, the function that is using it, that these functions are somewhere, it can be used. So, I can actually write something over here. What was this? It was analyzer, right? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create add, uh, a new item, and I'm going to call it analyzer, analyzer functs.c. So analyzer functions are here. And I'm just going to get these and put it right there. As long as the two files are in the solution, and where you are using them, you introduce them, life is beautiful. It compiles, runs perfectly as it's supposed to. Absolutely no difference. There you go. And when you actually walk through it, when you actually walk through it, it comes over, oops, one more time. When you actually walk through it, 
when you come to title, if you press F11, it actually opens the other file and goes in there and runs it right from there. You see that? Then comes back to the other function and to the other file that continues. If you could not do this in a program, it was impossible to write a program. Just imagine, you have an accounting program with, what, three million lines of code? How could you write it in just one file? It's impossible. Compiler cannot compile it. OK? So if you are on matrix and you want to compile this, how do you do that? Remember that GCC-wall thingy that you did? So you write GCC-wall. OK? And then write dash O, the name of the executable, say, analyzer. OK? So that's the name of the executable. Now you want to put the name of the files, right? Or you put the name of the files before this, right? So in here, I'm going to say program.c, and then add the other one, analyzer functs.c, as many files as you want. You had only one, you can put 50 files if you want to. No problem. It's actually better for the compiler. So compiler first compiles this. When it's done with it, it compiles that. When it's compiled, it compiles it. It compiles all the files one by one. And as soon as they are finished, links them all together and names it analyzer. Now, if you forget putting one of the functions inside if you forget putting one of the functions, say I didn't put the HR, right? And in here I'm putting it. So if I right click over here and go compile, it compiles perfectly. Succeeded, failed, nothing wrong. It trusts you. I told you there's a tutor down there in a learning center. You trust me, OK? Nothing's being linked. You're not linked to the tutor. You're not going over there to get help. You trust me, everything compiled, no errors. But as soon as you want to build it, which means link everything together, then it's going to tell you printf. Oh, even printf, I'll tell you what, well, that's a problem. But unresolved external HR referencing function main, you see that? It tells you that. And why did I have printf over here? Because I use printf in here without including standard input output. I was a bad boy. So all those things that I had in there, I have to put in this one too, if I'm using any of the C stuff, all right? Again, remember, every single file gets compiled separately. And because of that fact, if you use a function from a library, you have to have the library up there. Because this gets compiled by itself, then the other one, then they're all packed together. As Do we understand how it works, the functions? All right, now let's start writing some functions, OK? <clears throat> I'm going to save this one as analyzer.c. OK? And add and remove it to the solution as I, as I go. So I can teach stuff using prg.c. So functions, I'm trying to open this, where, oh, there you go. I'm going to write a stupid function, a function that is not needed. I'm just writing it to show you something, OK? Remember this HR thingy that we have over here? Actually, it's not stupid, actually. I could have. Let me actually use that. This HR thingy, it creates, a, it draws a line, right? How long you want that line to be? It may vary, right? So you want to have a longer line, lower line. So I can actually pass something to this. I can pass an integer, and I'm going to call it length. So I can send a copy of an integer into this one called length. Now I can go in my functions and actually write over here int length. Length, OK? 
Now, how can I draw a line with the proper length? It's easy. I can simply say integer i. It's just a loop, right? For i set to 0, i less than length, and i plus plus, printf one assignment operator, and that's it. And then at the end, go to new line, printf backslash n. Now, how many, how many was here? Thirty-one. Okay, so I have thirty-one over here, which means now when I'm actually calling this, I have to put over here thirty-one. Ta-da! I just created a a function that can draw different size of line, different sizes of of the same line. So. So now it's 31 characters. If I could, I can make it 40. So I'm going to make the bottom one 40 and the top one 31. OK? So when it actually runs, it runs like this. Let me go to HR. So I put a stop sign over there. Then I'm going to run it right down to that, to that point. Two. In here, I'm going to put one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, and 12. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, four, and 44. Hit enter. Now, you see this 31? A copy of this 31 is going to get passed into length. So what happens is that as soon as it goes over there, the length will be initialized to 31. Then it comes in here, does a loop from uh, 0 to 31. I don't want to bore you with that loop. And then it ends it, and that's going to be the output, 31, right? And then the next time it's called, so it prints everything that it's supposed to print, OK? Prints all these stuff. Now it gets called again. Remember, every single time a function is called, the program starts from 0. Everything gets reset. Now, the copy of what value got to get sent to that one? 40. So as soon as it goes into that function, the length is this time 40. OK? And now, when it actually draws it, it's going to draw 40 characters. I have a bigger line now. So I actually have a function that I can reuse for different programs, not only this one. That's how you reuse your functions. The functions that are written and you need in many different programs, you put them in proper files, and then you're done. Are we okay with this? Yes. Can you count the number of characters in a Count the number of characters in a printf? The number of characters it prints? Yeah. You just asked me a beautiful question. Here's in my eyes. I'll tell you why. Printf actually returns a value. You don't know. So you can actually put an integer over here. You can say n is set to. OK? n will be the number of characters printf printed. In this case, it's only one. OK? If you ever need that. <clears throat> I think I used it twice in my life. But, <laughs> but it may be used. OK? That's, that's how printf works. Printf returns the number of characters printed. OK? Visible and invisible. You can have five new lines. It goes five lines, but it's only going to return five because five characters were printed. Are we okay? Are we okay down to here? That's when you <clears throat> pass a value inside. Okay? Are we okay with this? All right. A very simple, let me just save this. If I'm losing you, let me know and I'll stop, okay? Oh, shoot. Come on. Analyze our close. <clears throat> OK, so <clears throat> you can pass many things to a function. 
let's say I don't want to always use the assignment operator to draw a line. Sometimes I want to use dashes. Sometimes I want to use asterisks. Why do I need to print that? If that's the case, I can actually pass that to the, to the function. So in here, I'm going to say print with this length and use this character for it. What should I call the name of the variable? Body. OK, that's the body of the line, right? I want to. So now I'm going to go back to my program in here and receive a character. And in here, go percent %c and print the ch. On purpose, I put a different name for you over there. Why is it giving me that? Oh, comma. I forgot the comma. All right? The names that you put, by the way, these are called prototypes. The name of the functions that you put at the top is called prototype of a function. OK? These are called prototypes. The names of the variables in the prototy prototype of a function are completely optional. And you can put anything you want. Some programmers that I hate, even some of my colleagues, do this. You can even do that. That's the worst thing I think you can do. Because it doesn't give any message what those things are. You know it's just an integer and a character. It will work. If I compile and run it, it works perfectly. But when you have the opportunity to give the person who wants to look at your program to understand what is the content of that integer, why not putting over their length and, length and body? Even for the prototype, it doesn't matter if you want to use it in a function or not. Maybe you just want to call this len. Fine. Call this one len. You want to be quick when you're programming? Put len over there. Fine. There's, nobody's going to tell you don't do that. But when you are writing the prototype, use full, meaningful names for your variables. So when somebody looks at the function prototype, they know what this function does. Right? I think that's going to be a good thing. Now that I have this, I'm going to come over here and I'm going to say the top one I want it to get created with, uh, with the assignment operator as it was before, but the bottom one I want to use dashes. Okay? Oh, sorry, and this one's supposed to be 40, right? If I can type, of course, 40. Did I? Screw, no, the other one is correct. Okay. So now if I run this, it's going to run like this. One, two, three, one, two, three. Ah, that's fine. And then 34, 34, 3, 4, 5, 55. It's going to run like this. So the bottom one is with the dashes, and top one is with the, with the assignment thing. Are we okay with this? Are we okay? Are we okay? Yes. What else can we prototype like that? Hmm? What else can we prototype like that? What else we can prototype like that? What do you mean by that? So, structures. Like potatoes, huh? <laughs> <laughs> what do you? Uh, can we do with the structs? Uh, I got that, yeah. <laughs> okay. Don't listen to this guy. He's evil. <laughs> Come to, we'll come to it soon. That's in OP244. OK? No, no. That's called forward declaration. OK? But it, it's going to come to that. Not now. All right. So we understand how these things work, right? So that's the, these are the prototypes that we have for that. Now, you can have functions that they don't receive anything, but they return something. What's a good example for that? Hmm. I'm receiving an integer over here, right? OK, scanf is too long for me. I don't like it. I'm going to create a function that returns an integer, and I'm going to call it get integer or get int. And I'm not going to pass anything to it. OK? So everywhere that I'm receiving an integer, instead of having this, I'm going to say number of marks is set to get int. Do I have it anywhere else? 
that I'm receiving stuff? That was the only thing? No. I had it somewhere else. There you go. I have two over here, right? Get int. Get int. Now the program has to be redesigned sometimes. Redesigned sometimes to <clears throat> fit your function design. Scanf can get two things at the same time, right? A function can only return one thing at a time. I cannot return two things at a time. It's impossible. So I have to have two different things, two different messages. Instead of showing that, I have, to, I have to have something like this. I have to say over here, percent D, uh, student number, something like that. So it gets the student number and then show another message in here I'm going to say mark all right do I have anything else anywhere any other scan of that was it those three now I'm going to compile it perfect it compiled did I write the function no, you can use your imagination. Just build. That's called prototyping. You actually write it and compile it. Everything's good. Now let me go write the function. Initially, when you write the function, you don't have to write something fancy. Write something that just works to see if everything's OK. So in here, I'm just going to say int, get int, void. Now I can only return one thing else. So I'm going to read a number, right? So I'm going to say int num. I'm going to say scanf percent %d, put it in the address of num, and now send the copy of num back when you're done. Now you know what that return is in your main. So it's going to actually, when get int start, it builds a, uh, an integer, reads that integer, returns it out. As simple as that. So when I actually run this program, I'm going to go right here. So when I run this program, it's going to print the title. Oh, get int, I put lowercase, then I put uppercase over the bad boy I am, very bad boy I am. Um, um, control H, and that's one of the good features of get int. Replace all, problem solved. Okay, now one more time. There you, there you go. So it actually comes over here. Please enter the number of marks for analysis. And it hasn't executed the get int yet. Now it's going to go to that function. As you see, marks over here is garbage, right? It's going to go to function get int, create a num with garbage in it, scan the number from keyboard to, I hit enter. Now num becomes two. It returns a copy of that two back in where it was called. Still, this is garbage, right? As soon as it's over, you'll see it becomes two. So it essentially returns that two back to number of marks. Ta-da, it works, right? And when I go to the next one, it's going to be, the execution is going to be kind of different, but who cares? I can live with that. So it's going to come over here and say student number, another get int. So it's going to say, what is the student number? I'm going to say, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Hit enter. Then it's going to go to the next one, and it still says, one, mark. Tell me what is the mark now. Now I'm going to say over here, 34. Hit enter, and it continues. So it's working, right? Now let's make that get int intelligent. You know that's impossible. I'm just going to try to cover all my bases so the get int is actually getting an integer in a way that user cannot make a mistake. Remember about, I said, when you are actually writing a program, you can see what is the range and you can tell to the user what's wrong with it. We assume that user is sane, but doesn't know what the range of data is. 
but sometimes, not sometimes, our default of the system is that the user is insane and you should be able to catch any mistakes they are making. So that's what we're going to do. So for that, we need to understand what is buffered entry. Buffered entry. What the heck that means? If you want to enter something into any command line program, what is the process? How does it work? What do you do? Analyze it for me. I want you to like, close your eyes and assume that somebody says, what is your age? How do you respond to that? I know, it's a very simple question. These are the, these are the ways that you have to learn to, to think. When I ask you about a single task, you should close your eyes and explain as basic as possible how that task works. Now, my poor friend over here is on the spot on that. So I'm asking, you don't need to tell me your real name, age, but, but if I ask you what is your age, what do you do on the keyboard? And then hit the enter. So we type the age and we hit the enter. This is buffered entry, which means you, you put 24. Nothing is passed to our computer. You can still fix it, right? It's still in a buffer. As soon as you hit the enter, everything goes in. The buffer gets flushed into your program, into Scanf. Are we okay with this? That's why you can get two things in a Scanf. You can put percent D space percent D, then you put student number space mark, still nothing goes in. As soon as you hit enter, it flushes everything in. The first value goes in, space is passed, it takes the second one, right? Are we okay with this? Okay. Now, we have to see how user can make mistakes. I'm getting an integer. If I get an integer, if I get an integer, what are the options of the user for entering? User can enter 999, that means I mean an integer, and hit enter. Right? This is perfect. Right? Another way of entering it is that user hits few spaces and enters the integer. What did you do? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So, is this bad? Nah. Still okay. Although few spaces, but it's still an integer, right? Sometimes users 999 and then that's bad. Correct? What happens when you do something like this? When you hit enter and you're reading an integer. So this is your code. This is your code. So you say int num scanf comes over here and reads integer and you are putting number. Uh, line 18 in there. What happens? Scanf, buffer gets flushed into Scanf, right? Scanf starts reading. Nine, good. Nine, good. Nine, good. A, can I convert that to an integer? No. Stop. Num will be 999. And all these garbage will wait in keyboard for next Scanf to come in. And guess what? Your next Scanf is another integer, right? So what's going to happen? The next one is going to pick up A right out of the bath. Right out of the bath is going to pick up A. It can't read it. Nothing gets passed. Just skips. And the next one, and the next one, and the next one, you go into an endless loop until everything's finished. Got it? So, how can I detect if anything garbage was entered after the number? What is one type of thing that I can write that can read anything? Huh? You're close. What type of entry I can put that can read anything. String, again, string is not a type. I said what type? 
character, right? If you read a character, no matter what they put, character is going to pick it up, right? Let's do that. And the only way the data entry is correct is that the integer entered is immediately followed by an enter key, right? Other than that, it's garbage, correct? All right, so what do I do? In here, I'm going to come and say int, oh, sorry, character. I'm going to call the character new line because I want it to be new line. Then I'm going to say scanf percent %d and a percent %c right after. Put the first one in num and put the second one in new line. Okay? Now I have to check. Another scenario or scenario, okay? I want to <clears throat> I want to follow all four of these and walk through with these ones. Actually, it's your turn. First scenario, okay, this one. What is in num? What is in new line? Num's going to have what in it? Num's going to have new line. Backslash n, right? Because the second one is immediately after, and that's the enter key. The enter key has a code of its own. It's new line. It's backslash n. Correct? For this one. For this one. What's the first one that's going to get picked up? Yes, 999, because it's space, it skips all the spaces until it gets to something to be able to read. Space are always sp skipped, space, spaces, backslash, uh, uh, new lines, tabs, all these things. So first one is not 999, the second one, enter, so backslash n, so good. So as far as I know, down to this point, if this new line is backslash n, life is beautiful, right? My lady over there. For this one, what's going to get picked up? What's going to be in num? What's going to be in new line? No? This one. What is right after 999? A. New line will be A, which means garbage. Which means something went wrong. Correct? Now, this is a tricky part that I'm going to ask you. <clears throat> If this is entered, what's going to happen in here? What's going to be in num? What's going to be in new line? Line 19. I put the difficult one for you. <laughs> I wanted to ask you first, but then I said, wait. <laughs> no. Scanf won't give you an error message. Scanf tries. If it tries, it won't read. No, don't, 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 don't. Analyze. Don't tell me what's the final result. At line 25, what are the values of num and new line? Whatever it was before. Nothing's going to be read. The first one that it was reading crashed. It couldn't read it. It couldn't convert A to an integer. It stops right there. Because it stops right there, num and new line will remain whatever it was before. Now, for me to detect that this new line is actually a backslash n, I have to guarantee that by, by chance there is no backslash n in it. So I'm going to initialize that value to, say, I don't know, whatever. x, 0, whatever. I'll put x just for the heck of it. Now back to the question that I ask you. At line 25, what are going to be the values of num and new line? Num will be garbage, and new line will be x, because it can't read it, right? So now I have what I needed. If the new line in here is not new line, it means something went wrong. If new line has a backslash n, it means an integer was read, and immediately after there was an enter, I'm good. And because every single time you're entering something in a keyboard, you end the data entry, you flush the buffer with hitting enter, 
nothing can be after enter. Right? When you type, you hit enter. Type, you hit enter, right? So every time you do an enter, you hit enter, that's when it's scanf gets activated. And that's what happens over here. So now I can write, you have done it already. What do I write? You have done it in your lab to see if the values of minimum temperature and maximum temperature are okay. How do you do the validation? While, if, schmiff. Okay, <laughs> while new line is not equal to new line, it means, what does it mean? It means printf invalid integer, try again. And I have to read it again. One problem though. Let's say I'm here, right? Let's walk through for line 18. For line 18, num will be 999, new line will be A, correct? Correct? It comes in here, it's going to print, it's not new line, it comes in here, invalid integer, try again, tries to read it again. But SLD and everything else is still in keyboard, correct? which means it won't be able to read it. It crashes. The values remain exactly what they were, comes over here, it's not new line. And it goes to an endless loop, you're gonna forever see an invalid integer try again. Let's try it. <clears throat> so if I run this program, now if I enter over here, 999, this is what I'm gonna get. Because it can't read, okay? What do I need to do? When something that happens, I have to, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm going to pause this. To make sure everything's okay before reading, the first thing you do after an error happens, when you have garbage in keyboard, you flush the keyboard to make sure there is no garbage in the keyboard, right? How do I flush the keyboard? I don't know. I'll write it later. Flush keyboard. Okay? Does it look okay to me? Now let's walk through. <clears throat> Line 18. It comes, reads it. 999, correct? That one becomes A. New line is not. A is not backslash n, comes over here, invalid entry, entry, try again. It flushes the keyboard, which means takes, get, gets rid of all the garbage in the keyboard and makes it fresh clean. Then it comes, and now because the keyboard is clean, it waits for the next entry. It's flashing over here, and hopefully the user comes to its senses and actually enters a proper integer. If it doesn't, it comes back up, invalid entry, flushes the keyboard again, correct? Let's write flush keyboard. So how do I write flush keyboard? First of all, I'm gonna write over here void flush keyboard. And I'm gonna write it down there. So, if I have a keyboard full of garbage, what are the values? How can I read them one at a time? <coughs> what type can read anything? Character, right? So I have to read one character of the t uh, at the time. When do I get to the end of the buffer? When I reach what? New line. New line. That's it. So all I need to do is to create a character, character junk, because that's what I'm reading, right? Now I'm gonna say do. And in here I'm gonna have while that junk is not equal backslash n. So while that junk is not equal backslash n, 
scanf keep reading the junk and put it in junk. Done. So it comes in, reads one character. Is it new line? No, reads the next one. Is it new line? No, reads the next one. It keeps going like that. Right? And now I have written a function that will not let the user go until they actually enter something nice. So if I run this program, please enter. I'm going to go hit enter, invalid entry, try it again. Anger. OK, if I put 2, 3, 4, 5 in garbage, still. But if I actually put 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, and hit enter, then it accepts it. OK? And it keeps going and so on and so forth. OK? Um, are we OK? Wow. I want, to enter, <laughs> I want to enter those many marks. Holy mother. OK. <laughs> All right. So we learned three different functions, three different types of functions. Functions that receive. Nothing, return nothing. Functions that receive something, doesn't return anything. And the next one you're going to come next day will be the one that is going to receive something and return at the same time. Have a beautiful day. And please study. There's going to be a quiz on this. On this, that has three points. Next time, no, I'm kidding. Go. <laughs>